Does the book of Genesis and the theory of evolution contradict? If you accept the theory of evolution, do you have to reject the opening chapters of Genesis? So in other words, as a Christian, do you have to accept the young earth creation theory and reject what modern science tells us about the age of the earth, the universe, and evolution? Recently I read a book by Dr. John Lennox of Oxford University titled Seven Days to Divide the World. The book directly addresses this topic and reasonably argues that as a Christian, you do not have to automatically accept the young earth creationist view. The first thing Dr. Lennox points out is this is not the first time the beliefs of the church and science have collided. In 1543 AD, when Copernicus published his scientific theory that the earth revolved around the sun, many Christian leaders rejected his theory because they believed scripture taught that the earth was fixed in its position and did not move. Psalm 93 verse 1 says, Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. However, today, it is not even questioned that the earth moves around the sun. But is the authority of scripture compromised? Dr. Lennox says, In many places, a literal understanding will not work. Let's take first an example from everyday speech. We all understand what a person means when they say, The car was flying down the road. The car and the road are very literal, but flying is a metaphor. However, we are also aware that the metaphor flying stands for something very real that could be expressed more literally as driving fast. Just because a sentence contains a metaphor, it doesn't mean that it is not referring to something real. Metaphors are also used throughout scripture and no one seems to misunderstand them. For example, no one thinks Jesus is actually a vine because of John 15.1 or an actual door because of John 10.9. No one reads the poetic books of the Bible and assumes Psalm 91 teaches God has actual wings. The reader is expected to have a little more common sense and understand these passages as metaphors. So what of verses like Psalm 93.1 and Psalm 104.5 that says the earth doesn't move? Dr. Lennox says, We now know that the earth does not rest on literal foundations or literal pillars. We can therefore see that the words foundation and pillars are used in a metaphorical sense. However, it needs to be emphasized once more that the metaphors stand for realities. God the Creator has built certain very real stabilities into the planetary system that will guarantee its existence so long as it is necessary to fulfill its purpose. Science has been able to show us that the Earth is stable in its orbit over long periods of time, thanks in part to the obedience of gravity, to the inverse square law, to the presence of the Moon, which stabilizes the tilt of the Earth's axis, and to the existence of the giant planet Jupiter, which helps keep the other planets in the same orbital plane. Earth's stability, therefore, is very real. Even though our interpretation relies on scientific knowledge, it does not compromise the authority of scripture. And this is the important thing. Scripture has the primary authority. Experience and science have helped to decide between possible interpretations that scripture allows. So with this understood, let's take a look at the creation account in Genesis. Many have argued that the Genesis creation account must be understood literally, but is this the way it was intended to be read? Did the author of Genesis write the creation account like a historical narrative? When you study the evidence, I think the reasonable answer is no. Two things should be noticed when reading the creation account. The language is very poetic and very vague. The Hebrew scholar Edward J. Young notes that the creation account seems to be too poetic to be read as a historical narrative. Every day begins with, then God said, and contains repeated phrases such as, and God saw that it was good, let there be, and it was so. Repetitions such as these are not typical for historical narratives, which is why the scholar Edward Young says the creation account is written as semi-poetic language. Also, we should note that the creation account uses words like greater light for the sun and lesser light for the moon. These are distinct examples of poetic language and are not used anywhere else in the Bible. The phrase beast of the field is a term for animal in the creation account, but it is usually confined for poetic usage. If the creation account is supposed to be read as a historical narrative, then why is it not written like the rest of Genesis? Why is it written more like a poem? It seems the author doesn't want us to understand the creation account as a literal historical event, but rather a poem of God majestically and passionately creating the world. Examples of this can be seen in other places in the Bible. Judges chapter 4 is an historical account of a battle, and Judges 5 is a poem about the battle. Judges 5 verse 4 says, The earth shook and the heavens poured. But there is no account of this happening during the battle in Judges 4. Verse 20 says, From heaven the stars fought. There is no account of this happening during the battle either. 
yet we understand these to be metaphors for the glorious victory the Israelites had in battle. The creation account seems to be written in the same way and is not meant to be literal history of creation, just a beautiful metaphorical poem of God creating the world for humanity. Now the second thing to note is the language is very vague. What I mean is the words used throughout the chapter can easily be interpreted several different ways. Take the Hebrew word yom. In the creation account, this is the word for day. However, the same word is used throughout scripture for other words, such as daylight, time, year, ago, always, season, continually, ever, and age. So we cannot be sure that the days in the creation account are supposed to be interpreted as literal 24-hour days. Another issue is Genesis 1-2. In the King James, it is translated as, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. However, the language surrounding this verse is very vague and can be translated completely differently. The first word, and, can also mean, and it came to pass. The first half of the verse can also be translated as, and it came to pass that the earth became chaotic and vacant which seems to indicate a time period between God creating the heavens and the earth and the actual poem about God filling the earth with life. In fact, if we look at the entire chapter, we see that every day starts with, Then God said. However, the first two verses are separate and do not start with this phrase, which indicates they are separate and should not be included in the first day. We also see something interesting on the fourth day when God made the sun, moon, and stars. Many theologians, like the 3rd century early church father Origen, have noted that it doesn't make sense that there could have been three prior days without the sun existing yet, which is another good indication that the creation account is only a poem. But also, John Collins says, the verb made in Genesis 1.16 does not specifically mean create. It can refer to that, but it can also refer to working on something that is already there, or even appointed. Dr. Lennox follows this quote by saying, Indeed, this interpretation fits well with the explanation, given in the very next verse of the function of the sun and moon as visible lights in the sky. That is, the verse is speaking about God appointing the role of the sun and the moon in the cosmos, and not speaking of either their creation or their appearing. So not only do we see there being clear evidence that the creation account is more poetic than historical, there is also the point that several of the Hebrew words used can have different meanings, and do not have to be understood from the perspective of the young earth creation view. Now for several Christians, this creates another problem. If we accept that the earth is billions of years old, and it is possible God used evolution and natural selection to form the thousands of species on the planet, then how do we rectify the fall of man and death entering the world? Well, let us look at what the Apostle Paul said on the issue. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. Now Dr. Lennox notes that this verse only says death spread to all men. It doesn't say death spread to all living things. We must see that this would be impossible for death to spread to all living things, since God commanded Adam and Eve to eat living things in Genesis 1.29, resulting in the death of living organisms. The death of plant life could not have resulted from sin, since God permitted the death of plants in order for man to eat. Dr. Lennox also notes that the Bible teaches humans are distinct from animals as moral creatures. We do not judge the animal kingdom by moral laws that we judge other humans on. We do not think a leopard killing and eating a deer is committing a sin. We may feel bad for the deer because we're moral creatures, but that doesn't necessarily prove that what is happening is wrong. So it appears the animal kingdom is separate from humanity. It is possible that God used the process of natural selection to bring about life on this planet and then God separated man as a distinct moral creation to be different from the rest of life. Then, of course, man sinned and we were no longer completely distinct from the rest of creation and experienced death. Another problem that needs to be addressed is the genealogies in Genesis. Young earth creationists say that the earth is 6,000 years old because the genealogies in Genesis give us the exact age of the earth. Well, in the book on the reliability of the Old Testament, K.A. Kitchen says, Within Hebrew and related tradition, such official father-to-son sequences can represent the actual facts of life, or they can be a condensation from an originally long series of generations. Matthew does this in chapter 1, verse 8. He leaves out several kings mentioned in the book of 2 Kings in his genealogy. So it is possible that the genealogies in Genesis 1-11 through are not lines of direct fathers and have been shortened. 
The last issue I will address is Exodus 2011. Young Earth creationists argue that this verse is a clear reiteration that God did create the Earth in six days since the Israelites did not work for six billion years and then rest. However, Gleason Archer responds to this by saying, By no means does this demonstrate that 24-hour intervals were involved in the first six days, any more than the eight-day celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles proves that the wilderness wandering under Moses occupied only eight days. Archer points out that the length of a commemoration is never an indication of an actual event's time length. The commandment in Exodus 20.11 is only pointing to God's creative week as an analogy for the Sabbath. Now I know a large sect of the church still believes in young earth creationism, and it might be hard for some Christians to accept any part of evolution, but I want to point out that you can believe in evolution without compromising scripture. It is not required you believe the earth is 6,000 years old if you are a Christian. Many early church fathers did not take the days in Genesis as literal days. So do not feel you have to either when the scientific evidence doesn't point in that direction. As Dr. Lennox has said, Scripture has the primary authority. Experience and science have helped decide between the possible interpretations that Scripture allows.